I'm Dr. Mark Donoghue. The following presentation, Biotoxins and Moles After the Aussie Rains, was made on Clubhouse on the 30th of March 2021. The presenters or moderators are Dr. Sandeep Gupta, Nicole Bilsma and Dr. Mark Donoghue. This recording has been made with the permission of all of the moderators. Please enjoy. This is, this is brand new technology for me and this is our first clubhouse. This is um, a clubhouse that arises from a story I did with Wendy Harmer on her radio station in Sydney, let's see, that was last week. And it's a media issue that will come up more and more about moulds arising after the floods. So the first dramatic issue of the floods is the massive rains and the damage and the, the problem that arises weeks to months down the line is that all the ingress of the water eventually leads to mould overgrowth and if anything from last year or 2015 is to go by, there will be lots and lots of uh, interest, shall I say, in moulds and why people are getting sick over the next uh, few months down the east coast of New, so of New South Wales primarily. Now, it seems that 6 million people, which I think is about a quarter of Australia, are affected so it's not going to be a trivial problem and, and I think we're going to have to kind of bone up a little bit on what mould toxicity is, what mycotoxins are and that's what the point of the clubhouse is today. So we hear about following, you know, the mouldy stuff following the rains. Friends and patients from down the east coast face not only the devastation of floods and damage but the mop-up leaves the toxic legacy and thousands are affected and my practice got overrun in 2015 and again last year by people who are sickened in ways that the medical profession really doesn't pay much attention to. We're here to help. This is not, uh, even though I'm president of ACNIM, which is the Australian, Australasian College of Nutritional Environmental Medicine, this is not an official ACNIM meeting. We haven't even kind of addressed Clubhouse yet. It's a tryout with low numbers of forgiving friends in a new medium just to address mould and biotoxin issues and maybe to use the Clubhouse medium to take on some questions after because we've got two people here that I'm really proud that just put their hands up and said, yeah, I'll come and talk. Just a housekeeping, we're all new to Clubhouse, I think, uh, so we're starting off small. Errors will be made, mainly by me. And uh, the panel, we have conceptually on stage. So if you're looking at your screen, the top of the screen is the stage and conceptually those people who are on the stage are able to talk. If you get to the stage, which is you've raised your hand for a question later on, you need to mute your microphone until it's your turn to talk. Remember, once you go to the stage, you can be heard and any shouting at spouses, children or pets <laughs> will be broadcast. Um, we'll deliver an opening talk. Just I've asked Nicole and Sandeep to give a uh, talk, one from the perspective of building biology and moulds in buildings. And then Sandeep I'll be turning to for the potential allergic, immunogenic and toxic effects of moulds and their biotoxins. So once these two presentations, no, they're not presentations, they're talks, this is far more casual than a presentation. Once that's done, I'll turn on the uh, little raised hand icon at the bottom of the screens and anyone who wishes to ask, contribute, put some, be uh, some detail into things that we've raised will be most, most welcome and we'll attempt to address those. Um, I will mention that Sandeep said that he probably will have to go at about 6.45 our time, which is 5.45 his time up in Queensland. So I make, uh, we'll try and prioritise any questions that are going to Sandeep at that time. I'm uh, Mark Donahue. I'm a medical practitioner. I've been in practice 35 years and 32 of those have been in the area of environmental medicine. Um, I'm a fellow of ACNEM, which is the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine, but I'm not here in an official capacity. I'm here simply to introduce the talent today. <laughs> Sandeep is a good friend of mine, a specialist and general practitioner focusing on complex uh, and chronic disease. He graduated, he's a newbie, only in 1999, 20 years after me, would you believe it, and has worked as a cardiolo in cardiology, medical and anaesthetic as a registrar. Is an interest in integrative depression and anxiety treatment, adrenal glands, thyroid dysfunction and treatment of parasites and other gastrointestinal infections. Since 2014, his interest in chronic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS has led him to create a course called Mold Illness Made Simple. And of course, the website for that is www.moldillnessmadesimple or one word.com. 
Uh, he's a good mate of Richie Shoemaker over in America, and I think it's probably true that no one in Australia knows more about Richie and chronic inflammatory response than Sandeep. So maybe you could take us through. Let's uh, we'll get back to uh, Nicole at some later date. But if you can take us through the health effects of moulds once they get established, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Mark. And and I actually really do share your sentiment about the recent floods and and how likely it is that. Uh, many people are going to develop problems related to mould and dampness. And actually, I'd, I'd mentioned that to a, a number of people just in the, in the couple of days before you invited me to this, so very timely. Mm. Uh, and also, I will mention that uh, my introduction into this whole world of uh, mould and mycotoxin-related illness uh, was when I had a home flood in around 2012 on the Sunshine Coast myself. And my partner at the time actually became extremely unwell as we watched the, you know, the, the, the garage become full of water. And then we subsequently watched all our possessions uh, develop microbial growth all over them. And, uh, and then I saw her become more and more unwell. And according to the medical understanding I had at the time, I didn't really understand how something as seemingly innocuous as mold could have uh, resulted in that. And so that started me on a search for finding more information uh, regarding uh, mold and fungus in general and how it affected the human body. And as I said, that, uh, as you said, rather, that uh, led me to find Richie Shoemaker uh, and start his training. And it was actually a suggestion of a patient who came in one day who said he, um, she had listened to a podcast with Dr. McCullough and Richie Shoemaker and um, there was something called a visual contrast sensitivity test, and she was uh, wanting to go on to a medication called cholestyramine. And I can't tell you how blank the eyes were that I looked at her with, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was totally blank. I had no yes. idea what you were talking about. And, um, however, I think someone else a, a few days later mentioned to me that there was a physician training that Dr. Shoemaker was offering. So I got in touch with his rooms and got virtually no correspondence back for a couple of months. And then finally I got something back. And I think it was six months and it was set up that I'd have a Skype call with him at 1 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. He only only consulted or he only was available for three hours of the day. Um, But as soon as we we got, we made contact, there there was definitely a connection there and he got really excited and said, I want you to be certified within one or two months. And I was like, whoa, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> slow down here, buddy. I'm just starting. You know, I've got my training wheels on. Um, and he was talking about all of this terminology that, you know, that was really nothing that had been in my vocabulary up until then. Right. And so I really just had to sit down with dedication and read some of these thousand page documents that he sent me. And, you know, with a, a kind of blind faith that it was going to lead me to something on the other side. Yeah. So, it was, which, year, it was which year was that? That was 2014, I'm going to say. Right. I'd say there was at least a gap of a year since that flooding and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, then I got certified. It would have been that same year right at the end. And, and then I had a, a huge influx of people who were interested in finding out if mold um, was part of their condition, you know, particularly people who had chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah. And they wanted to find out if they could do the tests. It was almost like it became in fashion in the CFS community, and you would have seen that as well. I'm I did. Sure. I did. In fact, that, that was, you know, part of the big issue is what's the cause, and Richie's found a new cause. And it's not all that new. It goes back as far as humanity, but the discovery yeah. of it was pretty impressive. Yeah, that's right. And so had a huge influx of, of patients wanting to know more about it. And so really I break it down as, as there being three primary types of illness due to um, mould and dampness. And the first type, which I think is the most familiar to most medical practitioners, is mould allergy. And you know, generally the, the, the signs people often have when they're, they're suffering from that is you know, things like um, runny nose, um, you know, a runny nose, a, a 
sorry, try that again. A runny nose, a itchy nose, a um, blocked sinus, yeah. throat irritation, and and there can be a cough or a little bit shortness of breath. But it doesn't usually result in someone being bedbound or having debilitating fatigue or anything like that. It can be, you know, in some cases it can be somewhat debilitating, but you could say that's a milder end of the spectrum of mold-related uh, illness. And, and often what we use is blood tests and skin prick tests looking for evidence of, of allergy to various molds such as aspergillus and, um, and alternia and various other species. Yeah. Uh, that's probably the, the mainstay of treatment from that, for that is avoidance and then desensitization therapy, which many allergists do in their rooms. And uh, people get, get dosed up on antihistamines as the uh, yeah. alternative while yeah. they wait for the allergist. Yeah, exactly right. And, um, and, and there's probably some crossover there with what we call Marshall activation syndrome. Uh, which is also another, you know, when I thought I had already understood mild illness, here comes another complication, right. uh, mast cell activation syndrome. I'll get back to that later on. Um, the, second, the second type of illness related to mold and dampness is mold colonization or infection in the body. Um, most medical practitioners are familiar with, um, with aspergillosis, particularly yeah. as it relates to the lungs, uh, but probably not as familiar with other types of mold colonization, such as rhinosinus uh, fungal colonization, which is actually well described in the literature. Yeah. And even cerebral abscesses is, is described in the literature as well, although not something we see very often. Thank God. But yeah. yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. There's actually a really interesting article, Mark. I was going to tell you about this. Um, the Indian Journal of Neurology was basically saying that there's a certain rate of people who have sinus infection due to fungus that actually then become cerebral abscesses. And that really, that kind of really opened my eyes wow. a bit towards, towards that uh, side of the spectrum of mold illness because it's like, hang on, if we ignore this part, um, aren't we opening our patients to a potentially mm -hmm. very severe problem? So... Uh, I think that, that that can be very severe in some cases. Of course, the, you know, the, generally speaking, um, it only gets known of is in, in a patient, for instance, who's uh, immunosuppressed and develops something like an aspergillus or an invasive candida in the bloodstream and develops something uh, what basically called sepsis. And, uh, and that's a very severe end of the spectrum of, of mold colonization. But... You know, the literature seems to say that there's a reasonable proportion of just chronic sinusitis, which is due to, to fungal colonization. I think you uh, think that's uh, it's missed a lot by the medical profession that think everything's bacterial in a way, don't you? That we don't think of fungi, we think of bacterial, we give people systemic antibiotics rather than focusing on fungal colonization of the sinuses. Yes, I agree totally. And I, I think one of the reasons is that fungus is just simply harder to culture. Yeah. It's harder to grow, and therefore it doesn't tend to show up as much, and therefore it tends to get ignored. And, uh, and, I, and I suspect it's also underrepresented in the literature because of this. Yeah. Um, but, but it probably is actually a large proportion of, of chronic sinusitis cases are related to, uh, to fungal colonization. And, and if you read um, Dr. Tiedelbaum's book on chronic fatigue syndrome, he says that's one of the, the very common hallmarks of chronic fatigue syndrome is chronic sinusitis. And have, have you seen that quite a bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, chronic sinusitis has a source of ongoing infection and immune activation and neutrophil loss, you know, as it migrates there. So I think, I think that's absolutely true. It's always hard to tell what the bug is. As you say, it's hard to culture. Um, because the nose is teeming with bacteria and the fungi tend to be ignored by the pathologists. And so it's very, very difficult to get a good you know, sensitivity to what antibiotic or what antimicrobial we'd use. However, neti yeah. pots are there for saving us, aren't they? So, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and one, way, one way of thinking about it is that the nasal cavities are like a filter. And just like an air filter that you have in your house or in your business, um, you have to change the filter every so often. Right. So you can see the Nedzi pod as being a filter change, a right. regular filter change or a filter clean. 
of out. your your nasal filter. Um, they got explained to me by Dr. Ackerley, a psychiatrist from America, one time, and I thought, wow, that's a really good explanation. And yeah, I think that's a really good place to start. There's something mm-hmm. called Neomed. If if you think you may have a, a fungal sinusitis, yeah, using the Neomed nasal irrigation device. Uh, on a regular basis, and then considering adding in either silver or iodine can be really useful in just clearing up those sinuses because what appears to happen is that the immune system gets very sidetracked in trying to deal with chronic sinusitis, and uh, and therefore that appears to then affect the, the energy levels and also the ability of the immune system to deal with any other threats in the system. And so... Um, it's it's actually a very important thing to address uh, in in chronic sinusitis, whether it be fungal or otherwise. Right. Uh, and and as you know, Mark, so the treatment can be you know herbal antifungals. It can just be sinus rinses, or it can be actual pharmaceutical right. antifungals in, in some cases. But as you as you say, I think it's a difficult choice sometimes to know uh, which approach to take in people. But I think the first thing is just keeping it in mind, isn't it? It is. I mean, being aware of it. But both of those areas are part of the orthodox medical understanding. And so th- th- this comes now to your area of expertise as well. Uh, what is it about mold mycotoxins, chronic inflammatory responses? That's a whole different level as I see it. The others we manage symptomatically and we get by. But CIRS seems to have been ignored. Yeah. That's right, and that that as a, that was the third the third category I was going to talk about is where you, you basically have a whole body chronic inflammatory response, and uh, so it appears that you know if you're in a building that is very water damaged, and whether that due to be you know whether that be due to a flood or whatever other cause, let's say you have a family or you have a group of six workers, quite often what you'll find is that everyone has some really mild symptoms like a bit of a cough and maybe a little bit of sinus, but one or two people are really majorly affected. And they don't just have some local symptoms in the nasal passages um, and in the lungs. They've got whole body symptoms. Right. So it's not just a, a single system illness. It's something that affects every organ system in the body. So it's not just like, hey, I've got a bit of a sniffle and I've got a cough. It's I've got a sniffle and I've got a cough and I have no energy and I can't sleep and I've got massive anxiety and I've got some skin rashes and I've got abdominal right. pain and I've got some bloating. But things, other than that, things that don't fit together and almost automatically result in psychiatric referral, don't they? <laughs> so, yeah, well, that's a good point as well, isn't it? I if mean, you have you too on, many symptoms, it can't right. be true. That's right. That's why we have specialties in medicine. Yeah. No, I think that's a really good point you're making there. And I think one possibility is that we just haven't really been educated on multi-system illnesses very well in in the in the current medical system other than you know very rare things like autoimmune and connective tissue disease right Uh, it's considered that if you've got a condition that affects almost all of the tissues of the body and your blood tests are pretty normal then come on you must be your depression or anxiety Mm. yes Thank God many of the antidepressants have uh, antihistamine properties as well, <laughs> just by sheer good luck. All the tricyclics started as antihistamines before they became antidepressants, and so maybe there is something deep in medicine that links the two together. Yeah, exactly. So um, so I guess what Richie Shoemaker's big contribution was, one of the big pieces was that he... He hypothesized, firstly, that there is a, um, a gene defect in the HLA genes yes. that, that makes individuals susceptible to CRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the more we're looking at it, we think it's probably, it may turn out to be a bit more complicated than just the HLA genes. But, but I think that was a really reasonable hypothesis to start with. And... It, it does appear that, that there are differences in the HLA genes, even though some of the physicians internationally, like Dr. Neil Mason, are now saying, well, it's probably not, not worth really um, worrying about checking the HLA genes in, in unwell patients because they don't seem to very accurately uh, distinguish between control cases and cases of CIRS. 
Um, however, it's probably, you know, probably that we need more research in this whole field. So anyway, that was one fundamental thing. The next thing he found is that there was a distinct pattern of abnormal biomarkers that patients with CIRS could be found to have. And that's where the alphabet suit begins. <laughs> right. And um, and so this is so so tracking back to visualizing me at one a.m. at night, not a very pretty picture. Um, Richard Shoemaker starts talking about C four A, TGF beta one, and MSH and VIP. Right. I've been and, confused uh, by the same acronyms and initialisms myself. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so do you want me to do you want me to go through those, or is well, that too much? I deep? thought I thought maybe that's a bit too deep. I mean, what we're okay, what we're okay. doing really at the moment is, I think we're dividing this up into there's simple things. There is, you know, moles if they get to sufficient numbers in any building make everybody a bit sick, and so 100 percent of people get sickened by mold mycotoxins if it gets to a sufficient level. A yep. smaller proportion who have, say, the maybe 10, 15% allergy sensitivity get very specific and obvious inflammatory symptoms that doctors can pick up. But then there's this last group, the CIRS, that I'd, I'd love to know, you know, a little bit of the detail of, say, we've got a mouldy home, people are getting sick non-specifically and, you know, quite sick and in, with inflammatory conditions. It's more, what can you do about that? Do you have to do the Richie Shoemaker, we pull down this home, we pull down this home? Or is there is there something that we can do as doctors or something we can do in building biology that's going to make a difference and get people back to health? Yeah, it's a million-dollar question, isn't it? Right. And, uh, and I think I think it's individual to some degree. But in general, I think Dr. Shoemaker's idea that basically people who have developed CIRS become exquisitely sensitive to yes. biotoxins yeah, appears to be correct. That appears to be correct. If you take that as the guiding principle. Now, I tend, you know, th there used to be a tendency to say to patients something like, if you don't get out of your moldy house, you're never going to get better. Yeah. And I've gone away from that kind of aggressive approach because I really... I really think there's a whole part of this uh, syndrome which relates to the limbic system as well, and mm. and just um, you know just that whole danger response. And yeah. I think when you use that kind of language with patients, it it probably aggravates them even more. And even if there's a good intention behind it, so the way I try to think about it these days is is and the way I explain it is that any improvements you make with regard to your living situation and your condition are likely to help and be cumulative. Now, how much improvement you need to make to actually get to recovery um, is still to be seen. Now, so there were some numbers that Dr. Shoemaker used to say. He used an ERMI test, and he used to have specific numbers. I used to say you need to score less than two on an ERMI test. And Which is one, a test managed by the building biologists uh, after sampling, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a type of PCR uh, test on dust yep. um, that, that generally gets sent to the US these days and gets, uh, gets run by one of the labs over there, such as Micometrics. And it looks at a whole range of, of mold species. And it, it's, it's a logarithmic test, and it basically um, subtracts what are known as beneficial molds from pathogenic mold and come up comes up with this ERMI score and so he said that you need to have an ERMI score of less than two that's very difficult generally speaking in Australia just given the building codes and he, he, sa he said if you have really bad blood tests um, you actually need to get a C4 uh, a ERMI level of less than negative one sorry so that that was his so the goodies but, outweigh the baddies by at least a bit right <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. And, and so, again, at this point, I tend not to be that um, exact about it because one thing is also that the Australian mold flora appears to be different to the US. And so I don't think that the ERMI scores in Australia exactly correspond. Right. And so, I, yeah, I do think we, that's one of the main steps we need to achieve through the research here is to create our own ERMI scoring, which is based on the unique Australian situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll be able to give us a better answer to that question of how clean, how clean does one's home need to be to recover from CRS? Mm -hmm. but, but generally speaking, I guess 
The simple answer would, would need to be that there needs to not be any obvious source of mold contamination. Like, I, I don't think a CRS person can live in a, a house where the, you know, they've had a major leak through the roof and all of the building materials in the roof are off-gassing mold everywhere. Right. So, you know, on, on basic principles, that's just not going to work. And so they've got to then face the tough decision of do I move out and, um, and, and, you know, t and, and also toss some of my possessions on the way out. Oh. That's actually a, a part of it as well, which makes it much more tricky. Or do I somehow try and have this place remediated, which, and then the cost of remediation is generally measured in the tens of thousands of dollars rather yeah. than the, the single thousand dollars. So it's not a cheap affair and it's not always successful. So, is there, um, is there any, uh, any value to the testing? I, I know you can do urinary mycotoxins. So can, can you tell accurately who's affected in a home and does that match with the symptomatology? Is, is that plausible to do that and make clinical decisions from that? Yeah, that's another really good question. And I think it hasn't been you know, 100% settled. And there was one original paper that was published uh, can't remember the year right offhand, but uh, by a, a group of um, a group of researchers, including an infectious physician, Dr. Brewer, and they they stated that uh, that chronic fatigue syndrome patients have basically 98 percent incidence of of mycotoxins in the urine, and normal controls have zero percent. Right. But I think you know there, there was a quite a few problems with that study. They didn't. They used a historical control group right. rather than a current control group and it really the, the current experience with the use of my, urine mycotoxin testing wouldn't really go along with that okay. with that that idea and i think great plains labs have published elsewhere that uh that possibly it's more like 80 percent in in CIRS patients, because there's, there's definitely some who don't excrete any mycotoxins, even though they're full of them, mm -hmm. just due to their, to their detoxification capacity being impaired, versus 50% in normal controls. And I'd be more willing to believe that. Uh -huh. okay. so, so therefore, it's, you know, it may give you an indication, but it's not definitive. Okay. What I, look, what I thought we'd do, if you, could, if you could in just a couple of minutes, if you could just give the broadest kind of sky-high overview what do you do when you run into one of these people? Do we refer them all to you, Sandeep, or <laughs> do we? Uh, we... No, I think I think acnum trained doctors should be able to to get the process started. Right. Um, at a problem, and and one of the one of the things that I've been teaching at acnum Mark, is is about the use of a mold sabbatical, right. and that seems to have been taken on well, which is basically where. Let's say you have a patient like this who's, who's you know, grossly unwell, they're all of a sudden massively fatigued and have a host of other symptoms. And maybe it's been after flooding in the area. That would certainly be a pointer that, 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 that having a cause related to mold and biotoxins would be more likely. Uh, one possibility would be to say to that person, well, would you be willing to go on a mold sabbatical for a couple of weeks? And that might include camping. Right. Uh, you know, so usually that would be the most recommended way of doing it would be to, to get them to go camping uh, with, a, with a tent that they know is safe and with a minimum of possessions and to really just de-expose themselves for right. a period of time and um, to, then, to then see if there's uh, any, uh, yeah, any reduction in symptoms. Yeah, it's almost sim it's similar to the basic acnum thing of like, try let's take gluten out of your diet for four right. weeks. Okay. Let's take dairy out of your diet and let's see how you go and then re-expose yourself. And so then, then they come back into their house after two weeks and if they notice a, a severe worsening of symptoms, I mean, it may not be severe, but if it's significant, then that tends to point to the fact that that home is having some impact on their symptoms. Right. It's Again, a little bit like the elimination and, uh, and challenge diet and, the, yeah, and the, yeah. the ones with salicylates over at Prince Alfred as well. So... Okay, that's. A, I mean, that's a reasonable way. In two weeks is enough, is it generally? Yeah, it usually is. Yeah, um, and uh, I don't know. I don't, we have actually Caleb Brad on the line as well. If you might like to bring him into this, Mark, because he has a lot of experience on on dealing with people uh, who are who are, have done extreme mold avoidance and um, and done um, uh, mold sabbaticals and so on. 
Right. Uh, if you wanted to, you could uh, bring him in and see if he had any comments on that particular point. But generally speaking, two two weeks is, is reasonable. Caleb, um, you're on the stage if you want to speak. Have you got anything to contribute there? Oh, hi, uh, Mark. Hi, Sandy. Um, okay. Yeah, look, I mean, two weeks is, is kind of a, you know, it's a rough guide, I think. Um, longer if you can do, you know, if you can do longer. You can't get many people to go camping for months. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it depends on the uh, the climate that you're living in as well. Yeah, uh, you don't want to, you know, worsen yourself um, by you know putting exposing yourself to the elements. Um, that sort of defeats the purpose. But uh, look, you know, it's sort of the thing. It's called unmasking. It's the concept of unmasking. It's similar to the gluten uh, concept that if you're always in mold you sort of you know you you feel sick you know you might feel sick but um you know if if you uh give yourself a break from it and then come back to it you'll um be more tuned to um the symptoms you know of a- right. any biological changes yeah the first yeah, step I, back I is I typically wanted... a big one isn't it so that you get symptoms that come on fairly quickly and identifiably after a rechallenge uh, it's the same concept, and um, you know, some people may not know as much of a difference, but I think that the the majority will notice at least, you know, a perceivable difference. You know, when exposed to mouldy locations and right. possessions as well. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. And, and someone explained to me once is like, you know, as it relates to gluten, it's like if if the switch is always on in your home then you're never going to notice any any yeah. change any fine changes you got to turn that switch off uh, yes. for, for then your body to be able to register i mean clinically that is also true that people report you know going on holidays going to the you know center of australia and all their symptoms arthritic symptoms headaches things ease up and we've always as doctors just said oh that's because you're relaxed and on holiday but often we're not paying attention to the home because we don't visit homes anymore. We just assume that every home is safe and mould-free. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And so, yeah, I think that's one of the big reasons I like it so much is it raises awareness. Mm -hmm. The patient then often becomes aware of of the impact of the indoor environment on their health and whether or not it's the primary contributory factor towards their illness. Uh, either way, they're probably going to develop a greater awareness of what's going on with regard to homes and so on. So, so that's a really important one. And the other thing would be um, would be considering using something like cholestyramine, yeah. if uh, you know, and and also the VCS test. Uh, mm-hmm. Those would be some really simple things that a GP could do if they're really, if they you know have someone that that's that's very unwell and uh, appears to to you know to be have have mold related problems um so yeah, let me get this right uh, the the visuals um testing is done to see if you are doing good so recovery or improvement of the visual uh testing and the cholestyramine is used conceptually to bind mycotoxins or to bind toxins in the gastrointestinal tract and transport them out is that fair or is that reasonable to yes that's, okay. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. It, the toxins tend to go around and round in, in the enterohepatic circulation, unless you bind them. Okay. And um, and so cholestyramine was used by that. Richie Shoemaker discovered it by accident. Yeah. He had a a patient come in with diarrhea who had been affected by um, fisteria, <laughs> another type of biotoxin. I know that was his origins. And, yep. That was Richie's origins, was the Fisteria yeah. publications that he did with the uh, fishing town. So I thought it was a good progression yeah, right. from but, there. Uh, yeah, they were very good, very good studies that he did. And he, he patient had diarrhea and a bunch of other symptoms. And he thought, let's just give her a bit of cholestyramine, settle her diarrhea down. But then she came back and said, but it's not just the diarrhea that's better. Everything's better, Doc. Mm. And that, that set him off on this journey. And I just think it's so interesting how... A lot of the things, a lot of the discoveries in medicine are made just by freak little uh, things like that. Nicole Bilsma is a building biologist, best selling author, PhD candidate, and CEO of the Australian College of Environmental Studies. Nicole was a former naturopath and acupuncturist with 15 years of clinical experience, changed a career pathway to become a building biologist after noticing strong correlation of many of her patients' illnesses and health hazards in the home. 
She's author of the best-selling Healthy Home, Healthy Family, and if you haven't seen her in mainstream media, you really haven't been reading. So I'll, I'll pass over to Nicole right at the moment. What do we do when, you know, we've identified sick people, we know it's their house, what Sandeep's just done is send them all camping for a couple of weeks, and <laughs> Caleb supported him in that. So there is a business for building biologists in making mould-safe tents to go, you know, anywhere around Australia. Yes. But within, within the house, what do you, what do you look for? So uh, a suspicion of a mould-related problem or someone calls you, What's, what's your task in that? How do you find out whether mould is important for that, uh, for that household? The first thing we do is take a comprehensive environmental exposure history and without fail we notice that m- nearly all of these patients with SIRS have been exposed to significant water damage buildings either as children, in workplaces, their car, um, so that is really important. The two markers to, uh, that are strongly causative for asthma and allergies are visible mould and odour. Odour is reflective there is microbial growth because it's emitting microbial VOCs or fungi farts, mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> which means that people are exposed to mycotoxins and MVOCs, which of course are some of the deadliest chemicals they could be exposed to on the planet yep. because you're in the way of them decomposing your house. <laughs> Once you understand what microbes want, and the thing is, it's not just fungi. We don't know in the chemical stew what exactly is eliciting all this response. You know, we've got the beta glucans, etc. But the reality is, in long standing water problems, you have a shift from gram positive to gram negative bacteria, and they have um, lipopolysaccharides that stimulate an innate immune response. So right. the thing is, is, is these patients with mold sensitivities. Um, are often nearly always develop chemical sensitivities and I believe from my um, experience with these patients is that their detoxification pathways, namely phase two, sulfation, glucuronidation, is blocked, which means their ability to deal with environmental chemicals, perfume, personal care products, fragrances, pesticides is completely compromised. So they become chemically sensitive and then they develop because the neurotransmitters are involved in the same detox pathways, they then develop anxiety, depression, potentially psychosis and all the brain fog symptoms. So as they get better, and the only way to do it, as Sandeep mentioned, apart from getting out of the house, is binders amongst other, you know, support MSH and VIP, um, is to get them out of that environment and reduce their exposure to chemicals, reduce their exposure to electromagnetic fields, a recent important study came out by Professor Dominic Belpome in France, who's the leading researcher on CFS, and he stated that a third of patients with electromagnetic sensitivity are chemically sensitive and vice versa. So when yep. you are exposed to routers, extenders, boosters, you are potentiating the impact of biotoxins, enhancing the permeability of the blood-brain barrier and allowing a free ride into the central nervous system, which is a real problem. So as a building biologist, I train them to go in and say, it's not just the mould, you've got to look for chemicals. You know, you've got patients who are on organic food, who are very health conscious, who've gone to lots of practitioners, and then you see seven cans of mortine in their house because mm. they have a fear of uh, spiders and they're happy to spray a can per spider. Yeah. You know? They drown the spider. They don't, they don't <laughs> kill it any other way. I think a boot would be better. And they don't think that that's affecting them, that those pesticides stay permanently in the archaeological dig site of their carpet yeah. and re aerolize every time it gets warm. So it's really a very big educational tool to say the cause of mould is moisture, a healthy home is dry Mediterranean-like climate, that's dry. Fungi isn't the problem here, it's moisture that supports microbial yeah. growth. And for me, it's the fact that people don't maintain their house. I clean my gut as every six weeks because I live in a high vegetated area. Most people I walk into their home haven't cleaned their gutters for years. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that their house needs to be serviced and tuned on a very regular basis. And if they're not spending a few grand every year maintaining that house, cleaning gutters, actually getting rid of surface dust that supports microbial growth, then that is problematic. All right. So, uh, I mean... That's good for home modification. And what, what's the specific advice? If you've, Do you get into the house and get under and have a look at it in building biology or does somebody get in and try and identify the specific areas, dry them out? Is that 
or is that too big a job? <laughs> yeah. Do you pull no, the house down the and build a do, new one? <laughs> well, ideally, in most cases not, thankfully. But the <laughs> first goal of a building biologist to test a water damaged building is to identify the sources of moisture right. and to identify moisture laden materials. Because as soon as a material is wet, for more than 48 hours, it will support microbial growth on its surface and become a source of actual growth. And that fungal particulate will spread from that area to other parts of the house. So identify the source of moisture, then do testing, moisture mapping, lab testing for air and surface samples to determine how far that fungal particulate has spread. If you don't do that, you cannot establish the boundary that right. the fungi has spread and therefore you cannot establish a scope of works or remediate. The problem in this country is you've got remediators employed by insurers, by builders who have no understanding of what happens in a water damaged building. They're going in and fogging. They don't clean appropriately. They don't even think about where the actual source is. And within weeks, the, the house is back to the way it was before, and it's just a disaster. When you look at the at the rainiest areas, the, the obvious thing is wide open housing with great airflow where everything flows through. It's practically outdoor but undercover. And when you come, where, as you go south, when we kind of get more and more closed houses and we're trying to conserve every ounce of energy that we can, the things closed up often make that problem just escalate rapidly. If there's no ventilation, it seems that's an innately going to become a problem once you know once the mold get established uh, without question and tim reached the architectural researcher tim law he had did quite a lot of research on tight buildings in temperate climates and showed condensation and water dripping in the roof void within right. one year of a new build it's a disaster 40 percent mm. of new builds having condensation by their first year and to the point where it did not consider the move, the building code and the National Construction Code do not consider the movement of water vapour through the building envelope. It is a disaster on such a scale. So when this gets to the Supreme Court, and there's multiple cases going on there now, BCAT, NCAT, the builder saying, I built to code, and the reality is the Australian standard 3740 for waterproofing and National Construction Code are not adequate. So the builders are complying but the reality is we've got huge problems with housing stock that is a disaster because the, the Australian standards and the code is not adequate. Right. I mean, Sandeep just had to leave us then. I forgot to mention that he was leaving a bit early. But Sandeep and I were down in Canberra uh, a year and a half or two years ago now and uh, the biotoxin inquiry went unusually well for the recognition of that the real estate industry was there arguing against having to build better buildings or do anything but i think that the the outcome of that inquiry was that mold toxin related illness is severe that it can be managed more by the environmental approach rather than the medical approach but once it becomes medical it is complex illness and very very difficult to resolve so getting in early having good homes well built and new standards would seem to be the obvious thing to prevent the biotoxin illness allergy and the whole mold problem oh, without question i mean i've spoken at the master builders head office and they and the people that come are older builders who've had 40 years experience they sit there in my lecture and go yep Cole, we agree exactly what you're saying but the reality is it's not the new builders you're seeing here. And the reality is to change an Australian standard wouldn't be till 2030 if you're on the board now. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So, Caleb, have you got anything to put in there as well? Oh, look, I think um, Nicole has you know, been very eloquent. Um, yeah, I just – it's. I mean, we were both invited to the um, – we both spoke at the Biotoxin Inquiry. I mean – yeah, I mean, it's amazing because in the um, I do a Facebook group, uh, Toxic Mold Support Australia, and since the uh, rainy weather, it's, we've had like two hundred people a, a week join. Wow! So it's um, it's a real, you know, at the moment it's a real, it's a real uh, difficult time for a lot of people, and a lot of people are just just finding out about um, you know these these chronic illnesses due to water damaged buildings. Mm -hmm. Is there a solution? I mean, if we, if your house is damaged, you've just been flooded and you've had water, you know, a foot deep in your house and you've cleaned it all out and the water's gone, 
Is there, Nicole, Caleb, is there anyone, is there advice to them to say, well, at least do the following and you've got the best chance of escaping long-term mould damage? Nicole? Sure, absolutely. I mean, the ICSC are considered world's best practice for remediation and the rule of thumb is you've got 48 hours. If you, you don't dry it within 48 hours, you will have microbial growth and VO, MVOC emissions, etc., and fungal particulate becoming aerosolized. Mm -hmm. If it's after 48 hours, then the rule of thumb, it depends. If you've got porous materials, the rule of thumb and carpets and things like that is to discard it. We call it what we call condition two. Anything with visible mould that's porous or semi-porous like bedding, furnishings, uh, carpet underlay, curtains, etc., with actual visible mould is to put it in a garbage bag and put it in your mm. bin because it means it's infiltrated that textile and it's already releasing potential, you know, fungal particulate. If it's condition two, say, for example, you had a flood and you didn't dry it within 48 hours, there's a good chance with testing it will have higher levels of fungi in the air sample, which means the Every, anything in that room is likely to be conditioned to high settled spores. The rule of thumb is once you've removed the moisture and therefore dehumidified and increased the temperature to accelerate drying is then to clean a HEPA vacuum, so vacuum followed by a microfiber cloth wipe. Right. You've got to remove the fungal particulate off the surface. Any dust in the house needs to be removed with vacuuming and um, a microfiber cloth because... And always HEPA vacuuming, you, right? Always HEPA. So you can't just use the old yes. kind of stir it up and let it resettle somewhere else. No, because the, in, the route of exposure is not just inhalation, it's through the eyes. And that's where so many people have had these weird thyroid disorders, fatiguing mm -hmm. syndrome in our industry in other countries because they only wore a respirator, not a full face um, mm -hmm. mask. So that's important. So if you've got SIRS, you shouldn't be cleaning those surfaces because that's when, when you disturb it, you get very high levels of fungal particulate in your inhalation and, of course, in your eyes. Right. We've got that. Is there a place for dehumidifiers? Do they work? Absolutely. If you are living in Central Coast, Sydney, Queensland, Darwin, permanent dehumidification is absolutely critical. Something with a hygrostat, so it kicks in naturally after 60%. After 60%, you're going to have a significant proliferation of dust mites, which, of course, is the number one cause of allergies worldwide. affects 21% of the world's population. You're going to increase, you know, um, termites, pests are going to be attracted to the property, etc. So dehumidifiers are absolutely important for Sydney, Central Coast and up because if you have high levels of water vapour, that's more than 48 hours, it's going to support microbial growth. The fungi in the carpet and on the dust sitting on your windowsill will utilize that water vapor and start growing so it doesn't have to be liquid water it could simply be high humidity high water vapor okay and the hepa filters the ones you can stick in your bedroom worthwhile or not just the air filters sorry yes as a band-aid approach to great yeah hepa filter that means high efficiency particulate air that that will actually filter out below 0.3 microns. All your allergens start at about 2 microns. So, yes, it's a good Band-Aid approach if you can't move out as a temporary way to reduce fungal particulate, but it doesn't address surface moulds. So when you walk on carpets and things like that, I mean, and settled surfaces, you, the cleaning is still really important because the capture zone will be restricted based on that unit. Um, and that's why, you know, it is a good temporary fix. And during mould remediation, they'll use air scrubbers with fil HEPA filters to make sure that fungal particulate, you know, is trapped in the HEPA filter. Right. Okay. Oh, Stephen Myers, invite her speaker. Stephen has now appeared and his hand is raised. So, Stephen, Stephen. go ahead. Oh, it's more just an observation, actually, Mark. I really enjoyed uh, Sandeep and Nicole and Caleb's uh, discussion uh, on a sort of completely um, separate topic, and I'll weave it back to where we are. Um, our, our research group recently did a, a wide-ranging systematic review looking at individuals that have chronic functional gastrointestinal disorders and found that there was a high degree of correlation with people who had fibromyalgia. Okay. Um, 
interestingly, you know, one of the things that Sandeep talked about was individuals with chronic fatigue syndrome having high levels of mycotoxins in their urine, also being the individuals that are highly chemically sensitive, yeah. also being the individuals that have got sensitivity to electromagnetic radiation. Um, it seems to me that we're starting to actually see that these things, these chronic inflammatory conditions that become systemic have lots of crossover points. They do, don't they? You know? Yeah, you're right. I think and, you're right. you know, I think... Right. Sorry. Yeah, and in the same way that we're actually relearning about pain, you know, that we've found fibres that, you know, neural fibres that should never be involved in the classical pain syndrome um, being recruited in pain syndrome. I think we're going to start to see a completely new understanding about various vectors in chronic inflammation. Because I would imagine the people that have got, you know, high mycotoxin exposure who have chronic inflammation go on to develop other conditions um, in the same way that people who've got functional gastrointestinal disorder seem to be able to develop fibromyalgia and vice versa. Mm. And I think as clinicians, we just need to be aware of the fact that the longer people have these very chronic systemic inflammatory conditions, the more likelihood is that they're going to actually become you know, multi-system orientated so that we have systemic dysfunction rather than just in an individual dysfunction. Yeah, tying together that complexity is, is fascinating, isn't it? I mean, there was a friend of ours, John Marshall, who used to say, one day we will discover the final common pathway for all of this, and it will be very simple. And uh, yes. I'm not sure about the simple, but I think that we're putting the pieces together, and in the end, the picture will look simpler once they're assembled. Yeah, well, in naturopathic medicine, we were told at the beginning of last century that the, the gut is the is the primary point that we need to actually intervene on. And, you know, I found it really interesting, you know, Caleb's uh, uh, telling of the tale of um, of how cholestyramine was found by, by cutting out an intrahepatic uh, circulation that you can actually significantly reduce um, mycotoxic load, I think was actually really interesting. So, look, on that note, thank you, Stephen. Your input was greatly appreciated. Nicole, I was so glad you got back. Thank you for finding the, uh, <laughs> the signal strength that you needed. And thank you to all of our audience. It's a small audience, but, you know, things will start from here, and I'm sure that we will grow this as we get a little bit more used to this medium. So thank you all. Good night and enjoy your meals. Bye. The recording that you have just listened to Biotoxins and Moulds After the Aussie Rains was made on Clubhouse on the 30th of March 2021 with the permission of all of the moderators. It involved Dr Sandeep Gupta, Nicole Bilsma and Dr Mark Donoghue. This recording is available for distribution as long as it is complete and with acknowledgement of the authors under Creative Commons. <laughs>